Okay, I think we'll get going here. I'm sure some more folks will join as we go. Um, so welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, so tonight we've got a special guest, Dan Hardy, um, talking about fly fishing Kiritamati or Christmas Island. Um, before we get to Dan, I'll just go over a quick few announcements for the Midnight Sun Flycasters, which is the, the club that's putting on the, the talk today. Um, so if you're not familiar with our club, uh, the Midnight Sun Flycasters was established in 1976. The goals of the club are to share knowledge, develop and refine skills, and promote fly fishing and fish conservation in interior Alaska. And some of our uh, notable activities, we do a kids camp um, every year in the summer. You can see a picture on the top left there of that where kids from age 10 to 16 um, go to the Lost Lake Boy Scout camp near Fairbanks and learn all aspects of um, fly fishing with their parent or guardian. They learn fly tying, fish identification, bug identification, all that great stuff. Um, we do have a few announcements for this year's one. It's looking like with COVID, um, it may not happen or likely won't happen, and we'll, but we'll definitely have one the following year. We also do periodic casting clinics um, and fly tying nights, and then you know things like stream cleanups and fishing get-togethers um, during certain times. So if you want to know more about the club, definitely check us out on our Facebook, our Twitter, or our website there. Um, so just some announcements for the coming um, until our next meeting. So um, if you're at all interested in uh, this BLM Central Yukon Draft Resource Management Plan, um, this covers like uh, lands along the Dalton Highway, the North Slope, um, kind of all over interior Alaska. If you're interested in, or if you're a recreator there or a fisherman, you might wanna check out the changes they have um, proposed in there and it, that's open for comment until tomorrow. So if you have any comments, you wanna get those in. Um, these, the uh, proposal period is open for Arctic, Yukon, and Kuskokwim sport fish regulation proposals. So if you don't like a certain regulation, you think it should be changed, um, you can put in a proposal to change that uh, up until May, I believe. Um, so for the club, we may do another socially distanced stream cleanup in May. <clears throat> we'll probably, you know, do that uh, along the Chena River or the Badger Slough, places where our members often fish, you know, to keep things beautiful and kind of get back to the community a little bit. And we do have a fly casting tune-up, kind of an informal clinic that Fred DeSico uh, is going to put on. So Fred's a certified fly casting instructor. That's going to be May 13th, uh, 6.30 p.m. at the Pump House Lawn. Um, we'd ask for that one if, um, if you want to attend, that you'd be a member in good standing or donate $25, the cost of the membership, to the club to do that. And finally, we'll have one more meeting uh, in April. That'll be our last of the season. Um, we'll have another one after that until probably September, and that'll be a, another virtual presentation by Taylor Cubbage, uh, who's a master's student at UAF, and she'll be talking about some of the northern pike research she's been doing in interior and south central Alaska, um, looking at, you know, some of their invasive potential and um, genetics work, I think. So that'll be April 14th at 6.30 p.m. Um, so that's about all our announcements. Definitely check out our, our um, website if you're interested in merchandise or to purchase an online membership, if you're interested in the club or its activities. And um, so I'm just going to introduce Dan here before I hand it off to him. So uh, Dan uh, has been fishing in Alaska and guiding for over 40 years. Um, he runs guided trips in South Central Alaska, you know, along the, the Kenai um, for rainbow trout, salmon, I believe. And then he's also um, does trips, DIY trips and guided trips to Christmas Island or Kiritamati. He does, you know, usually multiple trips uh, per year. Obviously COVID has put a kink in that, but I first ran into, well, the one time I ran into Dan was down on uh, the Susitna drainage. I was king salmon fishing and uh, he was also down there. I talked to him, chatted with him and um, he turned me on to his guide business, followed it on Facebook and just been loving all the, uh, the trout photos and of course the Christmas Island photos ever since. And that's what inspired me to, um, to ask him to talk to us tonight about the amazing fishing that uh, he does out in Christmas Island. So with that, Dan, I'm gonna hand things over to you and you can um, start sharing your screen and get underway. All right. Let's see if I do this correctly. Okay, everybody see that? Looks good. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay, how about the other guys? <laughs> so they're probably muted, huh? Yeah. Hey Dan, this switch. Hey Dan, this switch. Yes. Hear you fine. Thanks. 
Okay, yeah. so hey, Rich, how you doing? Five, five. Well, good, good to be here. Here you okay, so you guys, um, I'm not the best speaker in the world, but just bear with me because my goal is to, you know, tell you about a place I love that you know I go uh, to three times a year, and just you know relate to you how fantastic the fishing is and how easy it is to get there and. Um, there's a lot to cover. And um, like I was telling Kevin earlier, I only, I was only able to get like a quarter of all the information in just because there's just so much to cover. So uh, if I'm going too fast, let me know. If you guys have questions, just um, tell me what your name is and then ask the question and um, I will try to answer it to the best of my ability. Okay, guys? Okay. So um, presentation this evening is on waiting in the flats of Christmas Island. And already I'm having trouble. I, I'm not able to scroll through it. So um, just try clicking once on the presentation and then you should be able to advance the slides. There we go. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, the topics I'm going to cover are uh, Christmas Island location and geography, um, the logistics and accessibility, you know, how easy it is to get there. I'll talk about um, equipment and fishing gear, uh, lodging and car rental on Oahu. Uh, I'll cover a little bit on the moon phases. Um, I'll talk about fish facts and tips about um, the three uh, predominant fish that we go there and fish for, and then the insights to having a successful trip, and then the cost for a one week stay. So, um, Christmas Island, not to be mistaken for the Christmas Island that is in the Indian Ocean and is a uh, territory of um, Australia, this Christmas Island is in the Pacific, and it's a former territory of Australia. And it's the largest coral atoll in the world. People call it Christmas Island, but it's actually an atoll. And it's one of 32 atolls that make up the country of Kiritabati. Uh, it is a former Australian territory and it's located about 1200 miles south of uh, Hawaii and about 100 mi 130 miles north of the equator. It has five villages there, um, Poland, Paris, London, Tabwakea, and another one called Banana. Uh, Kiritabati as a country is probably one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and, you know, Kiritabati reflects that it's, it's a third world um, looking place. So, you know, you're not gonna have five, five star hotel um, accommodations or, you know, three course meals but uh, if it's fishing you're, you're looking to do and great fishing, that's a place to uh, check out. So accessibility, um, it's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, you leave Alaska, you fly into Hawaii, into Oahu, that's a six hour flight. You fly on Alaska Airlines and then from Oahu, there's one flight that leaves a week and that's on Tuesday morning and um, you fly from Oahu to Christmas Island. Uh, just keep in mind that um, you're crossing the international date line. So um, Christmas Island is 24 hours ahead. As a matter of fact, the fact is um, it's, the, it's uh, the first inhabited place in the world to see New Year's. So um, when you're making your airline reservations, just keep that in mind. You'll leave uh, Oahu on a Tuesday Three hours later, you'll land on Christmas Island and it'll be a Wednesday and vice versa. Leave on a Wednesday, land on Oahu, uh, it's a Tuesday. So when you're, you're making your reservations for your return flight back to wherever you come, came from, uh, keep that in mind so you don't uh, mix up your ticket. Uh, Alaska Air and Fiji Air are sister airlines. So I usually uh, do air miles. That kind of saves me some money. Uh, some of the first things you'll need for Christmas Island, um, you need to have a passport. 
you need to make your airline reservations, of course, on Alaska Air and Fiji Air, and you want to kind of do them both at the same time because I know guys that have, you know, booked their ticket on Alaska Air and then they waited to book their ticket on Fiji, come to find out the flight is booked. So um, always try to, you know, book them in conjunction with one another. Um, you know, hotel reservations on Oahu uh, and a car rental. And that just depends on if you're going there early. Um, if you're going there early, like I do, because I used to live there. So um, I have a place to stay over there. I'll go there like seven to 10 days early so I can just visit with old friends and go to old haunts and actually get some of that uh, rust off with my saltwater game. And I'll go fish some of the flats there. But um, if you don't have any friends that stay there, um, I'll talk about some of the uh, places you can stay and get a car rental. You'll want to get travel insurance. You'll also want to get global rescue insurance. And those are two things that I would not uh, scrimp on. Definitely get them because, you know, the flight may be delayed or you may need to be rescued off of, you know, Kira Tamati. Remember, there's only one flight a week. And uh, unless you have access to a private jet, it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars to get off of there if something happens. I put Pepto-Bismol and Cyproflox in there just because you are in a third world country. You're not gonna be able to drink the water. You can't brush your teeth with the, the tap water. You can't get the water in your mouth when you take a shower. And so I'm anal, I'm kind of anal that way. I don't wanna get sick on my vacation. So um, I take Pepto-Bismol and I'll take a swig of that before um, I have any meal on the island. Um, the cyprofloaxin is an antibiotic for intestinal uh, issues. So um, I always bring that. And of course, always bring your medicine. And um, you can't put the Pepto-Bismol in your carry-on, but bring all your other type medicine, put it in your carry-on. So it's always with you. Um, I also bring uh, currency and uh, denominations of 50, 20s, 10s, and 5s because when you land on Christmas Island, you'll have to give up 50 bucks right away for your fishing license for the week. And then, you know, I have tens and fives for, you know, maybe I'll tip uh, the boatman on $5 or tip the, uh, you know, one of the lodge workers five or 10, but it's good to have um, cash. Some of the clothing that you'll need, um, quick drying material, synthetic, um, you want to um, you want to have ultraviolet protection factor rating of uh, at least thirty, a minimum of thirty. Okay, uh, you want to have buffs, hats, just stuff to cover up, guys, because that equatorial sun is intense and you will burn. You know, I'm black and I burn too, so I can tell you it gets hot there. You also want to have hard sole flat boots. You don't want to have those diving uh, booties that you see some guys wear on the flats, you know, because it's usually sand flats. There's a lot of coral there, and they'll 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 rip those booties to shreds. Also, bring out gravel guards, velcro straps, keep debris from getting in my boots. Um, you'll want to have some type of uh, liner sock because you don't want to get blisters uh, over there in that tropical heat because infections happen quickly on sores. So, um, and if you're buying flat boots for the first time, you know, get in them and start walking in them. So you don't wind up having blisters. Light raincoat for like when you're on the boat or you're on the, one of the open air trucks, um, you'll get some spray when you're on the boat from, you know, the water just, you know, you put your raincoat on and you don't have to worry about getting um, all wet. Compression tights are a must because um, when you're wading in salt water, what happens is, you know, the sun, that heat kind of dries you out real quick, evaporates water, and it forms like a salt water uh, crystals, dry crystals on your body. And it's almost like sandpaper. So you can imagine your thighs, if they touch, <laughs> and they're like sandpapers, you can rub yourself raw. I've seen it where guys, have done that where they can't even fish for the rest of the trip because they're so sore. So you bring those compression tights and that'll alleviate that. You also can put wax in between your legs. Um, 
polarized glasses, uh, polarized sunglasses. I bring at least four pair. Um, I bring the Costas and the, I always bring an, a pair of amber colored glasses just because uh, they work really well in low light conditions. So you'll wanna have those. Uh, also bring some lens cloths. Um, I'll bring uh, lens cloths plus I'll bring disposable lens cloths because you're constantly trying to keep your glasses clean so you can spot fish. So you can pick up a packet of 100 to 200 for like, I think it's like nine bucks. And so um, that's a must because you, you want to be able to see the fish so you can cast to them. And uh, bring some sunscreen, although I've never had to use it, but I'm sure some of you guys may have to. As far as fishing equipment goes, um, I bring, I have listed here four to five, but I actually bring six rods and reels. I'll bring three eight weights, I'll bring one 10 weight, I'll bring one 11 weight, and I'll bring one 12 weight. I'll bring three weight, three eight weights because I know bonefish, you know, um, that's probably gonna be the predominant fish that uh, I fish for. And so um, stuff happens, I mean, You'll break a rod, you'll lose a rod, whatever. So I bring three of those. My 10 weight uh, is for trigger fish. My 11 weight is for uh, smaller trevally. My 12 weight is for if I decide to troll from the boat in the blue water. So I'll have a uh, 12 weight to 14 weight rod uh, for trolling. You'll have your saltwater fly lines, uh, tippet material. I usually bring enough tippet material ranging from um, eight pound tests all the way up to a hundred pound tests. Uh, backpack, fanny pack, you wanna make sure they're fully submersible. Um, I bring a sling pack now, but just make sure it's fully submersible because that is going to be what you carry everything in when you're walking the flats. So, you want to make sure it stays high and dry. A uh, hook release tool, knot tying tool. Uh, you want to bring a Leatherman, saltwater pliers, stripper sleeves. Um, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other stuff that uh, I have named that I know you should be bringing, but these are the main things that um, I, you definitely want to have. And you'll see my carrying case here, right? With the uh, rods and reels in there. Um, what you want to do is make sure you have a passport, a copy of your passport in every single item that you have, just in case. You can never have too many uh, copies of your passport. So I'll have one in my carry-on. I'll have one in my check baggage. So um, make sure you do that also. I also put all my camera gear in there. I, the things that I couldn't stand to lose or have stolen or misplaced, I always keep with me. So I'll put my medicine in there also, um, just so it's, uh, you know, it's always with me. As far as electronics go, um, I bought this Best Tech's power inverter. Uh, it charges all my uh, electronics. Uh, I hook all my battery chargers to them. Um, I'll also bring extra batteries and SD cards and Bluetooth speaker, um, like I said, my cameras, my tablet. I like watching movies there and uh, a headlamp. Now accommodations on Oahu. Like I said, I have a place to stay there. So um, I hardly ever use the airport Honolulu Motel. The only time I'll use that really is if I'm staying overnight and then flying over to an outer island. Uh, the reason why I use it is because it's convenient to um, the airport, it's only a half a mile from the airport. They have free airport shuttle 24 seven. Um, and so it's just convenient. So if you you plan on getting lodging there and you don't plan on coming like, you know, a week before or whatever, and you're just gonna do an overnighter, which I wouldn't suggest um, that be the place to stay. The reason why I say I wouldn't suggest it is once again, you wanna give yourself uh, some, some leeway uh, just in case something happens, a bag doesn't show up or whatever, and you can get it in Honolulu. Um, I uh, use my Costco um, discount through Costco Travel, and I find Budget or Alamo usually have the uh, lowest car rates. 
So after landing, I'll uh, pick up my car, go to the place that I'm staying at and uh, drop off, you know, my luggage and just, uh, you know, change into some shorts and, uh, you know, get some of my stuff organized, uh, start planning on what I plan on doing for the week there. I'll go visit some of my friends. This is Jeff and Bill. They live there. So um, they go over to Christmas Island quite a bit also. But uh, on this trip, they came over with me and uh, we had a good time. So I have a Costco bill here. So uh, some of the guys that I go over with, most of the guys that I go over with, um, we usually, you know, settle on, you know, well, should we go to Costco, make a Costco run? Yeah, they feed us three meals over there on Christmas Island, but who knows, uh, they may not have the steaks we want and we know they won't have the steaks we want. So we usually make a Costco run and pick up some uh, ribeyes and some chicken breast and, you know, some uh, salad makings and, you know, just uh, buy a cooler and stick it in the cooler and then I'll take it back to the house and wrap it up all properly and, and freeze what I need to freeze. And then the day that uh, we're leaving, we just bring the, the cooler and we pay for the extra charges um, for the cooler. But uh, yeah, this is, I mean, why go that far and not eat like King? So um, we'll always make a Costco stop. And after that, I just cruise around to uh, some of the places I used to hang out when I lived there. I mean, Hawaii is a beautiful place and it's a great way to try to, you know, get you to slow down and get your mind right uh, for the trip to Christmas Island. So these are places, these are like right across the street from where I'm staying at on the south side of Oahu, Hawaii Manalo. Uh, that's Sandy Beach there. So the other thing I do is I go fishing. Um, Kevin and I talked about this earlier. One of the reasons why is because uh, you know, it's probably been months since I've saltwater fished. And so, you know, it's just good to get out there and practice. And trust me, if you can catch a bone on a Wahoo, you're gonna look like Lefty Cray on Christmas Island because these fish don't give themselves up easily. Uh, Hawaii has some of the largest bonefish in the world and uh, they're just, they're hard to catch. But to me, that's what makes it so um, exciting is that, you know, I'm putting my wits against their wits and sometimes I win, most of the time they do. But it also kind of gets that uh, rust off of you as far as uh, learning how to walk and stalk and, you know, look for the, the signs and uh, just, you know, practice what you're going to be doing on Christmas Island. Yeah, Oahu, yeah, Oahu has some beautiful bones, some large bones. That's a fairly small one, but if you've never fished bones, these things are built, you know, for speed. And uh, a bone like that will go into your backing and it'll go 100 yards before it stops. And you won't be able to do anything about it. So the last night on Oahu, um, I have some traditions. So I normally, well, I shouldn't say normally, it's a tradition, so I do it all the time before I go to Christmas Island. I'll go to a Mexican restaurant because I know I won't be getting Mexican food on Christmas Island. So I'll go and have my uh, Mexican meal and uh, I'll have, you know, two, three, four uh, margaritas and uh, I'll be set. So um, I usually wind up uh, staggering home and going through my stuff, making sure it's all packed and ready to go because like I said, I'm on the south side of the uh, island and it's a 45 minute drive. And that's gonna be during rush hour traffic because remember we're leaving Tuesday morning. So um, I leave you know, in the dark in the morning just because I know I have a long drive and I'm gonna have to return the rental car. Plus I wanna get to the, uh, the uh, uh, Fiji Air Gate first. And the reason why I want to get there first is because they're really strict on um, your weight allowance, right? And so you can see on the left-hand side, check bags, business class, uh, 66 pound limit, economy class, 50 pound limit, 
um, you'll have to pay. So in economy class, you can go up to 66 pounds, but you'll pay, I think it is like 60 to $80 for that extra 16 pounds. Um, you'll pay 175 for the extra cooler that we're gonna bring uh, with the food in it. Uh, you have your carry-on that can only be 15 pounds, plus you can bring on a small backpack. Um, and so I get there first, right? I'm always there first, just because the scale is always on. So I usually wind up weighing everything, you know, taking stuff out of one bag and putting it in another bag. And uh, with the group, we do that just to make sure, you know, we're under the weight allowance. And also the other thing uh, that I found out the first time I flew on Fiji is that um, you'll have a check bag that you can get on, but like the cooler, they'll ask you, which one of these are the most important? And you'll say, what do you mean most important? They'll go, well, which one do you want to have guaranteed to get there? And so, you know, it's always my check bag, but if you're first in line, 99.9% .9 of the time, both items are gonna get on, both check bags or cooler because you're in the front of the plane. The people in the back of the line, guys that want to bring their surfboard or their scuba equipment, sometimes that stuff doesn't come because now they're getting close to the uh, airplane weight capacity and they won't board it. So um, that's one of the reasons why I get there early is just to make sure I'm first in line and I can get everything that I brought uh, onto the plane. Next stop, uh, we have to go through TSA. I don't know what it's going to look like uh, post-COVID, but this is what it looks like pre-COVID and it's just packed. And so uh, once we get through TSA, we head straight to duty free. And uh, here's where everybody picks up what they plan on drinking for the week. Um, I usually pick up some cigars uh, for myself and from some of my uh, guide friends that live over on uh, Christmas Island. Uh, you pay for it there and then um, they'll meet you at the uh, They'll meet you at the Fiji Airway gate and uh, bring you your stuff before your plane leaves. And so another thing that we do, we, we normally have breakfast after we leave out of duty free and uh, another annual thing we do, another tradition is we'll all have, um, it's called a Bloody Mary. So I hardly ever drink it, but whenever I go to Christmas Island that morning in the airport, in the restaurant, we all have a Bloody Mary. Uh, toasting for success. And then it's on to the uh, gate, you know, you wait for the plane to come in. Um, the plane is a 737. It's a comfortable plane. Um, they they uh, offer a free movie, a free meal, a blanket, and a pillow. So it's a, it's a really comfortable flight. And then before you know it, uh, two and a half, three hours later, you're doing your descent into Kiritamati. And I tell you, it's a beautiful sight. It's like seeing a jewel in the middle of this blue ocean, just sitting there. And you can see these bodies of water here, guys. These bodies of water hold different types of fish in them because fish come in from the blue water to go back in here and actually spawn. These are nurseries for like, you know, this area could have nothing but barracudas in it. Or this one here could have tilapia in it. Or the next one over here, milkfish. Or over here, you could have uh, trevally. It's just, uh, it's like a outdoor aquarium. There's just so many fish back there that it's unbelievable. And remember, um, the atoll is 140 square miles, but the inside of the lagoon has a shoreline of 38 miles. So even when you're in the lagoon, it looks like you're on an ocean, but you're really not. But um, that just goes to show you the, uh, the size of this place. So that's Jeff uh, disembarking, all smiles, we're excited. So I'm showing this picture here because it shows you the infrastructure, what, three years ago. This is a, the front facade on the uh, 
terminal building. It's like a one room shack and uh, you can kind of see the body language of uh, the guys uh, that got off the plane because you go through customs here um, and it's, it's hot. You've been on a plane for three hours. Now you have to wait in line just to go through customs. Um, you'll also pay, this is where you'll also pay $50 for your fishing license. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't fun standing there in the heat. You know, uh, you got three guys that are, they only work once a week, right? Because there's only one flight that comes in, but they're not smiling either because they're hot also. But, you know, this is the new terminal. This is the new infrastructure on Christmas Island. And so, you know, things are much more convenient now. Uh, the lines are just, they go through with no problem. They have air conditioner in there and fans and benches. And uh, it's just a seamless process now. And I'm glad they did that. Plus it puts, you know, more and you pay 50 bucks for your fishing license oh, interaction they'll load you on these open air trucks here and uh, you put all your gear on there and um, they come from um, the respective lodges that they come from so uh, the lodge that you're going to be staying at they'll meet you there with the truck and uh, you load all your gear on there and you start heading towards your um, lodge So this is the drive there. This is going through one of the villages and you can see um, the kind of conditions they live in. Actually, these houses are, are really nice because most of the dwellings don't have doors or windows. Roads aren't paved. So you can kind of see, you know, what the villages look like here. These are some of the dwellings from other villages. So you can see, you know, um, it's a poor place, but the people, I can tell you, they're, they're happy, they're humble. They always have a smile on their face. They're very religious. There's always some kind of church activity going on there um, all through the week, not just on Sunday. And so, um, you know, you'll see these folks, even though they're living in abject poverty, uh, they usually have smiles on their face. Uh, so, you know, they live a subsistence lifestyle and it starts when they're young. So these, these boys are already, you know, living the subsistence lifestyle and um, helping their community, their village. Like I said, they, they'll smile at you. They'll kind of look at you strange sometimes, like, you know, who are you guys? But uh to a person, they're usually really, really friendly. Of uh, this place here, I've stayed at um, four to five different lodges on Christmas Island. This is the last place I stayed at. It's called La Lagoon View Resort. And I stayed there, the last time I stayed there was January, 2020. And um, I really like this place, the lodge manager, he is on top of things. Um, you know, everything was top notch. Um, and, you know, what separates one lodge from the other, um, to be honest with you, is I think it's just the one to one guide ratio, because if you base it on rooms or food, they're pretty much all the same. But some lodges, because they go through travel agencies like Yellow Dog or, or Flywater Travel, um, they'll say, well, we're offering a one-to-one, -one, um, you know, client to guide ratio. And so um, they'll charge you more money, but um, I find you don't really need to do that. And if you look right in the back of the lodge over here, you can see there's a flat. You can walk right out behind your lodge and actually go fish for bones and trevally. There's another photo of it. That's the kitchen where they cook the food. 
and over to the left where the green chairs are, those are the rooms and uh, actually the uh, house, that's the lodge owner's house, that's uh, right there with the blue roof, but they're right there. So if any problems uh, come up, they handle them right away. That's me chilling after a long day of fishing in front of my room. It's about 85 degrees. So these are the rooms. And, um, you know, like I said, they're basic. They're, they're simple. Um, you, have a, uh, you have a drawer in there. You have a uh, refrigerator in there where they store all your uh, water and your beer and your sodas. You have a very small bathroom with a shower in there. And um, so once again, keep in mind, you don't wanna get the shower water in your mouth. You can use some of your bottled water to brush your teeth. Uh, another thing I would tell you about is when you go there and um, you wanna keep a running item of everything that is used in the refrigerator, kind of like how you do in hotels because um, what eventually happens is after three or four days, guys start getting a little loose drinking and coming into the room and, you know, drinking up your water and your beer. And then at the end of the week, you have a tab that, you know, you know, you didn't produce. So, um, you know, always keep a running tab on what you use out of your refrigerator. Uh, another view of the room. You can see that can of uh, bug spray. Um, you're in the tropics, guys. There's going to be um, critters, um, anywhere from cockroaches to centipedes to rats to crabs. So A, you wanna keep your door shut. Anytime you go in and out of your room, always close your door because um, you don't want something crawling in there. Um, and actually, you know, the bugs really aren't that bad. I mean. I've had it worse on Oahu. So um, if you have any problems with the bugs, just do a little spraying or actually just go tell, um, you know, some of the uh, lodge workers and they'll come in and take care of uh, any problem you have. They clean your rooms every day while you're out fishing also. Um, another room here, um, they keep it clean, you guys. They they always try to bend over backwards to make you happy. So um, you don't have to worry about being in a, a dirty room. Also, they have laundry service. So they have a little basket there in your room. If you wanna have your laundry done, um, just put it in the basket, they do it for free. And that helps with weight because um, I used to bring over, you know, like five or six different shirts just so I could get the hero pose in a different shirt, but you know, uh, that weight, adds up so you know all you need to do is bring a couple of shirts and you know a couple of pants and you're set just uh have the lodge wash them so one of the things i do right away um when i get to the room i start setting up my electronics um, because i want everything to be charged and ready to go in the morning um, i'll also start on my rods um, because i'm the host I'm the one that will be um, conferring with the head guide and the lodge manager and going over itineraries, going over lunches, going over guide assignments. Uh, we write down all the guide assignments on a chalkboard so everybody knows which guide they're fishing with in the morning. And that's a rinse and repeat cycle we do every night that I do every night just to make sure things go smoothly. At the end of the day, I'll go, um, talk to the head guide and the other guides and, and even the clients and just find out, you know, how the day went. Um, and so, you know, I have a lot to do when I, when I get there. So a lot of guys like going fishing, but me, myself, I have to start uh, just getting organized. Otherwise I, I might forget something. So this is me getting uh, one of my rods ready. I try to get a few rods ready before I have to go meet with the uh, lodge manager and the uh, head guide. I mean, man, this is just, I can't describe to you how cool it is to just hear the ocean and know that uh, you're gonna be out there fishing the next day. So um, 
what the lodge staff does uh, for the uh, incoming guests, and this is done every night, they fix appetizers. And it's usually a sashimi or breadfruit, or sometimes they'll have lobster, but um, they'll set it out right before dinner. And, uh, you know, you just kind of grind on that stuff, you know. Um, it's always fresh. So that right there is yellowfin tuna there. And that is Wahoo. And if you've never had Wahoo before, oh my goodness. And I mean, I like the sashimi style, but then I don't eat a lot of sashimi just because it's a little too rich for my blood. But uh, there's guys there that eat that stuff every night. But I really like Wahoo broiled because they have an oil of fat in them that is just, um, it's hard to describe. I, and I'm not much of a fish eater, but I'll tear that up. So after you uh, wind up having your appetizers, um, they'll have dinner out there. They'll set it up buffet style sometimes. Sometimes, you know, if the you know wind's blowing hard or whatever, we'll eat inside of the kitchen. Uh, the meals consist of dinner, uh, consists of anything from pork to beef to chicken. Um, the main staples will be uh, breadfruit. They always uh, bake fresh bread. Uh, another main staple is rice. Um, they'll have a mystery dish. Um, so uh, the dinners, um, they're pretty good. I mean, when you're out there fishing in, you know, 70, 80 degree weather and you're walking, you know, five or six miles, um, when you come back, you know, I could eat a bowl of sawdust. So um, this works. Breakfast, uh, they cook the order um, anywhere from pancakes to waffles to eggs and bacon to toast to uh, oatmeal, cereal. So, um, you know, that's good also. To me, the weakest link in the meals, um, it's, the, it's the lunch, just because uh, I'm not too keen on having a, a meat sandwich that sits in a cooler in that equatorial heat with ice melting. That's just me though, because I'm the guy that drinks Pepto-Bismol before each meal. So um, I don't do that. I'll have a peanut butter and strawberry jam. That's my fave sandwich. I'll have that on the, you know, the um, fresh bread they bake. Uh, I'll bring some, some type of nuts and some dried fruit and my bottled water and I'm good to go. So um, the meals are adequate. Plus the other food that we bring, um, the other steaks and chicken and all that stuff, we really usually have so much food, we usually wind up sharing it with the, um, the guys in the lodge staff. So here's some of the guys uh, after they had their appetizers. So um, while these guys are waiting on their meal, I'll go over and I'll talk to the head guide. And um, I'll talk to them about, you know, what kind of fishing we plan on doing the next day, uh, what flats are fishing good. And, you know, where we fish on the flats is in direct correspondence to what kind of tide we have going on. And um, so, you know, I'll talk about the moons and how they affect the tides, but um, I'll cover some of these flats. And as you can see, I mean, you could fish a different flat every day for a month and not fish the same flat. And I mean, some of these flats are just world famous, like Paris one, two, three. Um, that flat is probably one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been to, to fish. It's gin clear water, totally white sand bottom. And there's a phenomena that happens only on Paris flats. And that's uh, during a full moon, the bonefish go there to spawn. And I'm talking about in the thousands. And that's a phenomenon that, um, you know, if you ever have the time and the money to go during a full moon, it's totally worth it because you'll catch more bonefish than you've ever caught in your life but you'll catch it in such a idyllic setting that, I mean, it's, a, it's like a postcard. So um, some of the other flats are Nine Mile Flat, number 12, uh, Orvis Flat, number 33. These are just some of the flats that um, we'll access. And like I said, it'll depend on what type of tides uh, we have and what time they're falling also uh, during the day. 
So the moons, um, you know, I never really took into account how moons affect fishing um, because in Alaska, I really don't think about that. But saltwater fishing, you have to take into account the moons. And so I've fished all four moon stages on Christmas Island. And I know I'll probably, you know, get some, you know, negative feedback from people that go to Christmas Island. But to me, there's not really that big of a difference as far as fish are concerned. Now, um, there is a difference between tides. So your first quarter and your third quarter, they create neap tides, which are um, low tides that moderately come up on the flat and then slowly go off the flat. So what that allows is it gives you a longer time to actually fish a flat, right? Because you don't have as much water pushing up. And then your full moon and your new moons, those have more gravitational pull. And so they're gonna pull more water up onto the flat, which gives you a shorter time to fish the flat. Now, uh, why some people like fishing a full moon and a new moon for a couple of reasons. One, because that higher water, they say brings more pelagic species like your GTs up onto the flats. And, gives you a better chance to target them. And also uh, what I was telling you about Paris one, two, three flat, a full moon brings all those bonefish there to spawn. And so um, some people will dictate what time of year they go on their trip based on a moon. But in my humble opinion, um, I've caught GTs on neap tides where their back is out of the water and, you know, I've caught, you know, GTs when, or not as many GTs on a full moon. So don't let the moons dictate when you can go there, right? Um, if you don't have a lot of money, you can say, I want to go on this particular moon during this week, then just go because the fish are there. Um, also, uh, one of the things that I would say about the the neap tide is that um, because you are fishing on there longer, you, you tend to learn the flats better. And that helps quite a bit um, when, you, when you're fishing there. Because sometimes you get on the boat and you go out there and you go, did I fish this flat? And they'll go, yeah, you were here yesterday. So um, when there's a lot of water up on the flat, you really can't tell. And you know, ideally, if you wanted to fish a certain type of moon uh, stage, here's what I would suggest. Um, go like a first quarter into a full moon or third quarter into a new moon, which means you're fishing a neap tide going into a larger tide, which kind of gives you the best of both worlds. So that's kind of what I do. So I can, uh, you know, actually fish a neap and then fish it into the uh, full moon. So those are the four major moon phases that I fish. So, um, you know, you'll get up in the morning, guys. Uh, have your gear ready to go in the morning, okay? Actually have it ready to go the night before. So in the morning, when the guides come to pick up your gear, um, it's all ready to be loaded on the truck and you're ready to go. Uh, don't be that guy that, you know, um, you know, he wakes up and then he has to sit on the toilet. Everybody's sitting in the truck waiting and then he has to go get his cup of coffee. Then he has to go brush his teeth. And then, oh, he forgot to string up three of his rods. You don't wanna be that guy. Just have all your stuff, all your gear ready to go in the morning so these guys can load it up. Uh, like I said, the guy that you're going to be paired with, he will grab all of your stuff and put it on the truck but you must double check to make sure he grabbed it all, okay? So that's one of the things that uh, uh, you should remember, just when they're loading the stuff up on the trucks, uh, just make sure everything that you need for the day is on the truck. And so um, all the guides have walkie talkies so they can communicate with each other or communicate with the boatman. And at the end of the day, the guide will offload all your gear and rinse it off. And what I like to do after they do that 
is go get my gear and take my reels apart and set them in soaking water and uh, soak them in water and just uh, clean them some more. You can never uh, clean that salt water off enough. These are the guides. These guys, most of them have been doing this for 10 to 15 years. And so imagine walking the flats six to seven days a week, 10 to 15 years. They'll see things that you won't ever begin to see. They can cast left-handed or right-handed proficiently. They make me look bad. Um, so try to mimic everything they do. Talk to them. There's kind of a you know, cultural barrier between, you know, um, between the cultures. They don't talk much. They're very friendly, mind you, but they don't talk much. So you kind of have to pry, you know, stuff out of them. And it's not because they're arrogant. It's just that cultural thing. So feel free to talk to them, guys. Um, um, give them your camera. Show them how to use your camera equipment. Although they'll probably, because they've handled thousands of cameras, they'll probably know how to use it better than you. But, you know, talk to them. Ask them, you know, is this cast 40 feet or is it 30 feet in your, you know, estimation? Um, you know, just ask them about, you know, the country, just get them to open up and then you'll be surprised just the jewels that you'll get from these guys. That's me covered up again. Uh, you see, I'm ready for battle. Not too much is showing. I don't have my sun gloves on, but they'll be on. So this video is, um, shows, uh, right behind the lodge that I showed you that we stay at um, Lagoon View, View Resort. When the water's up, when the tides are right, the boat will pull up right behind the lodge and you just wade out. You don't need the truck to get to the boat dock. So this is pretty cool. Um, water is like, you know, 70 something degrees. And, you know, the boats are outrigger uh, style boats. Um, they have an outrigger connected to them. They, they're very stable to handle you know, the deeper water with ease uh, because of the outrigger design. Plus they can go up in shallow areas easily and uh, they're, made out of, they're made out of wood. So I hope this video is playing okay, but this is some of the people I had uh, in January and we're just wading out to the boat. It's, you can see the sun just rose. Here's an aerial shot of the outrigger boat. It's sitting on top of a pancake flat. Look at that beautiful water. Again, shot of the boat, white sand. And so if the tides aren't right and the boat can't pull up uh, behind the lodge, then we use these open air trucks to uh, access the uh, boat launch. Um, you see the rod holders there, you put your rods in there, you put your equipment in the back of the truck and you have a little bumpy ride to the uh, boat dock. There's Jeff and Bill again, my buddies from uh, Hawaii. This is a contingent from uh, Alaska. These guys and that girl on my uh, left-hand side, they put on a show uh, when they were there especially the kid in the uh, blue shirt. These are some boys from uh, Australia waiting to get on their boat. That's Bill again. Um, this guy here is, he's a guide wannabe, which means that he's in interning uh, to be a guide. So he'll start off doing, you know, menial stuff by carrying rods and you know equipment and gear bringing it to the boats offloading the truck then he'll work his way up to a boatman uh, actually driving the boat and if he gets lucky he'll uh, become a guide the guides on christmas island are rock stars they make more in a day than most folks there make in a year so they're like rock stars they 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 uh people kind of um you can kind of tell there's a little contention because they have lots of money compared to the other people there. But um, this is a, uh, a job that everybody really wants to get into. But this, this kid here will have to apprentice 
for probably five or six years before they even let them drive the boat. So they put the rods and the rod holders on the boat. This is me giving the hang loose sign as we're motoring. And this is us motoring out. You can see the boat stable You see how the guides sit on the boat. Uh, that's Justin from one of the other trips. You can see the flats. You see how it looks like you're almost on an ocean, but this is inside the lagoon. And so what we'll do, we'll pull up to these flats and drop off, um, you know, a, a guide and a couple of um, clients and, you know, they'll walk that flat and then the boat will pull off the flat and go to another flat and drop guys off and, you know, they'll walk the flats. And as you can see, there's hardly, you, you won't see anybody else out there. There's just, like I said, 38 miles of uh, shoreline. And so you'll get dropped off on the flats and uh, you'll just start stocking the flats. Um, you can see that blue water channel there. Sometimes that water moves through there like a river. So you're actually, sometimes when you throw your fly in there, you're actually kind of swinging it. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy. And so these are the three species that are mostly targeted on um, Christmas Island. And uh, I can tell you the bonefish are prolific there. The trigger fish are prolific there. And there's a lot of trevallis there. So um, I'm gonna start with bonefish first. Uh, I'll give you a few facts about them. The Christmas Island bonefish can get up to 13 pounds and that's a big bonefish. And you'll see fish in the five pound range and the flats are loaded with two to four uh, pound fish. And um, like I told you earlier, during a full moon, you'll have thousands of bonefish that um, go back to Paris flats to spawn. So if you've never caught bonefish before, this is bonefish heaven because uh, there's just a ton of bonefish there and you don't have to be an expert caster to uh, you know, have a 15, 20 fish bonefish day. So this is showing me getting off the boat, follow my guide. Your guide will get off the boat carrying all your rods and then he'll hand you a rod uh, specifically for the fish that you're gonna go after. So he's gonna hand me a bonefish rod. And so you see how slow he's walking? That's, that's how slow you walk and even slower. And you'll see how, how you carry your line. I have coils of line in my right hand and the fly in my uh, left hand. And it's because you can't drag the fly. It'll get caught on the coral. So when he tells you to make a cast, you won't be able to make it right away. So he spotted a fish and look at that. That wasn't a double haul or anything. That was just kind of a roll cast and boom. It's just that easy, guys. Watch how I feed the line back up onto the reel. That's a must because when you have a hot fish, that line will jump in your hand and it'll wrap around the butt section of your rod or your reel and you'll, you'll bust off. And, you know, that's not too bad if it's a smaller fish, but if it's a GT, you could lose a digit. So uh, be careful about that. Always separate your hands when you are feeding that line back on there. It's almost like doing a double haul, how you separate your hand. So always do that. That was a golden trevally also. That's a rare fish uh, for Christmas Island. There's another one, He's, we're, we're walking. I'm following my guide's lead. He's spotting fish that I don't even see. There's one down, there's another one down. Again. Follow his trips, trip, trip, follow his trip, boom, there he is. Feed that line up on that reel. And you can see there's, there's you know, um, pretty much white sand through there. So uh, when I'm fishing on that, I usually use 12 pound fluorocarbon, but this next picture you see, uh, you can see all the coral to my right. And so when I get into that coral, I'll, uh, I'll bump it up to 15, even 20 pound tests. 
just because um, that coral will shred your, your leader quickly. And if you can see, see if I can do this without messing this up, where the scroller is, see that right there? That's a tail on a trigger fish. And um, you know, you'll know you see that all through uh, the flats where there's a lot of coral because they feed in the coral to get to the crustaceans like shrimp and crab. And also that coral will hold a whole bunch of different species of fish because it's like a fortress that they can go in and hide in. And so um, when I started seeing those tails after a while, because I was catching so many bones, I just said, you know what? Um, I told my guide, I want to fish for trigger fish. And the guy goes, no, 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 you don't want to fish for trigger fish. And so here's where the communication comes in with your guide again, you guys. Um, they want to see you be successful, right? And so they'll keep you on bones all day. Trigger fish are probably one of the most frustrating fish you can go after. And so they don't want you to get frustrated or angry or whatever. So they all try to talk you out of fishing for trigger fish. But um, I always like the challenge. So um, the next day, all I did was fish for triggers. And that's an area, if you're looking for triggers, that's what you want to look for. You want to look for coral. But if you want to catch bonefish all day, you can do that also. Kind of get it spoiled. What do you got there? Bone broth. Nice bone. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to you. Let's see that. Good. Yeah. Fish, huh? Yeah. They are pretty fish. And the guides speak really good English, so. So this is Paris Flats, that, that area I was telling you about that had gin clear water and white sand bottom. I mean, look at that, that's a postcard. That's worth the price of admission right there. Um, but to be there during a full moon, when, you know, there's just, and we were there, that, I mean, during this time, there was a full moon there. And there was thousands of bonefish just, you know, swimming along this white sand bottom. You could just see them undulating under the water. It was like a black cloud moving. And it was just epic, epic bone fishing. Look at that postcard there. And big bones too. Look at that water. So this video here is, uh, it's a clip of being in the back country. And the reason why I'm showing this is because um, you can see how uh, geographically it is totally different than what it looks like where we saw uh, Paris flats. The back country looks like you, you go back in time. It's barren. It's, it's just a different place. But there's so many fish back there because remember that's where the nurseries are and you'll see when I'm fighting this fish if you kind of look right where my hands are um, and the reel you'll see fish scatter and you'll also see a fish following the large bone fish that I'm fighting also in the back country that's where you'll find your your largest bone fish because they don't really travel in packs they travel in onesies or twosies So watch, you'll see those fish scatter, like right in the center of the screen. See that? They're scattering. And now I'm working this big bone up to me and you'll see a fish actually following them. If anyone ever tells you that Kiritamati doesn't have large bones, just roll your eyes at them. You just have to know where to, where to find them. Look at that bone. They're just beautiful, heat-seeking missiles. I put this clip in here just because I love hearing my hatch reel. <laughs> Nice 
you know you're catching uh, too many bones when you just stop taking pictures of them, right? But, you know, I really like taking uh, different photos. Uh, Richard, who's one of the guests on here, he knows my wife is a professional photographer and she's taught me some tricks uh, when I take my photos. And I tell you, um, I just relive these moments all the time just by looking at the pictures. Another big bone. I have hands like uh, pitcher mitts, so I tend to make fish look small, but that's a big bone. It's another backcountry bone. Uh, that's that kid I was telling you about earlier out of the Alaska contingent. This kid put on a show. He caught so many fish. And so you can see you know, the scales are so bright, they're just hard to see. So you'll see bonefish swimming and you'll see milkfish swimming and you won't be able to differentiate uh, between the two, but here's a little trick. The milkfish swim higher in the uh, water column off the bottom. So they'll have a shadow underneath them. The bonefish are right on the bottom. So um, that's one way to tell the difference. And so I made a little clip of, uh, common mistakes, what not to do when fishing for bones. Um, you can kind of, you know, actually apply that to everything that you fished for, but um, I have it on video. First one will be what I was telling you about, about trying to keep the hands apart. Um, I didn't. Uh, the next one is, uh, you know, Murphy's Law that I, I kept the hands apart, but the loose line found something hanging off my body. So there we go. And then the third one is, is why I bring three bonefish rods. So he spotted a fish. I had to make a quick cast and then start stripping right away. Boom, 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 boom. And then boom. See, I didn't keep my hands together and the guy is just looking at me like, geez. Again, I'm following the guides. See how long he pauses to? I mean, it's amazing that he can see the fish stop. And he tells me when to go again. Boom, I got him this time. But had a mishap. He's pointing at other fish and I'm like trying to get my line untangled from my uh, saltwater pliers cord and, you know. Stuff happens. And this one was just why I bring other rods. I don't know if you heard that or not, but that was my rod breaking. I put too much pressure on there and tried to high stick it and. What a day. What a day. That one still smarts. So here's some bonefish tips. Uh, you wanna wade slow. Um, and actually, you know, after one or two days, guys, try to uh, talk to your guide and ask him, you know, can you walk in front of him? I mean, walk slowly because the slower you walk, the more you're able to discern movement, right? You're able to discern fish moving. So the faster you walk, it's harder to see what's moving, what's a rock, what's not. But the slower you walk, you can start picking out, you know, colors and shapes and see that, oh, this is actually moving here. Uh, you want to mimic your guide's movements um, until you get comfortable with knowing, you know, where to place the cast and, you know, you're able to see the fish and you actually see them following. So you can, um, you know, uh, strip, you know, when you need to or stop when you need to. So um, one of the, also the things you need to do is try to spot the fish before you cast. Don't let your guide rush you into casting, right? Because it's always good to see where the fish is going so you can place that fly uh, in the direction that he's going. And again, sh you know, slow, short strips with pauses in between. And uh, don't do what most Alaskans do, don't trout set. And so the next fish I'm gonna talk about are trigger fish. And trigger fish are also, all are also plentiful on Christmas Island. There's three different types. You have the peach face, you have the mustachio, um, and another name for them is the titan because they're the largest trigger. 
and then you have the Picasso. Um, triggers are easy to spot, like I showed you on that, that uh, one slide, because their tails are so large and they're feeding into the coral that their tails are always flopping back and forth. So you can spot a trigger from 50 to 75 yards off. But spotting them and hooking them are two different stories. And, you know, they'll tempt and taunt you with, you know, their tails flopping and you'll want to go target them, but they're hard to catch. And you'll have scenarios where um, you're able to stalk a trigger and get within 15 feet of him because he's so busy feeding, he doesn't even look up. You'll make a perfect cast and he'll spook. Or you'll do the same thing, walk up to him and make a perfect cast. He'll follow, he'll follow your fly until your fly line goes up into your rod tip and then he'll turn off. Or you'll make a cast, he'll follow, he'll take the fly and bite your hook into because their teeth are so strong from biting through coral. Uh, what you want to do is get a hook set in the, the, the corner of their mouth. And then if you're lucky enough to get the hook set in the corner of their mouth, you got to put the brakes to them because they'll run into the coral, go into a hole, their homes, and put up their trigger and you won't be able to get them out. Um, usually a guy to go in there if he really likes you. Uh, and stick his hand in the hole and try to push the trigger down. But uh, I can tell you there are a few guides on Christmas Island that are missing digits because of that, because they'll bite your finger right off. Um, so they have a powerful bite and they can cause, you know, serious bodily damage. That's why you want to, if you're holding a trigger fish, you want to hold them under the body. You don't want your hand anywhere near their mouth. And, you know, just a word of caution, if you get frustrated easily, don't fish for triggers because um, they can ruin your whole trip because they are just, um, sometimes they don't cooperate. So this is the trigger fish. And, you know, honestly, guys, um, they're like the Rodney danger fill of fish, right? They don't get any respect. But in my eyes, because they're such a worthy quarry to, to chase because they're so hard to catch, uh, they're at the top of my list. And the other thing is, is that the designs on them are so beautiful. They don't, they don't have the same design uh, on, on um, other fish. So you can see their, their fins. You can see the trigger on the top there. Uh, you can see the anchor intricate designs on their body. Uh, they even have some on their eyes. But the thing that sets them apart, um, this is a peach face trigger here. And this is smaller peach face caught on a bonefish fly. Um, what sets them apart, guys, are their teeth. So you can see those teeth there and the human-like lips. Um, those teeth are deadly. They'll, they'll bite right through you. You see how that fly is mangled. Um, they bite right through the hooks. They'll bite them right in two. So like I said, keep your fingers away from their mouth because they will do serious damage. This is a Titan trigger. These are rare because they're so big. Uh, they're smart. And the reason why they call them Titans or mustachios, you see that kind of mustache looking band over their top lip. Um, that's why they call them mustachios. So again, look at the different coloration on that fish and the different designs and spots and the, the eyes. They're just a freaky looking beautiful fish. That's a uh, peach face also. Uh, that's a smaller peach face. And that's what you're gonna predominantly catch. You're gonna catch uh, mostly peach face. Like I said, the, the Titans are um, a trophy. That's a feather in the hat if you catch one of those. And so there's a Titan. And you can see where my fly is sitting in his mouth. Now I'm sharing a top secret fly guys. This is a crack the code fly because um, like I said, these triggers don't give themselves up easily. And when I showed this fly to uh, the guides, 
they kind of turn their nose up at it. They like using um, a flexo uh, looking crabs, but um, this fly right here, I've caught more triggers on this type fly here than any other fly that I've had. I, I call it cracking the code because CTC, because it works. There's the Titan trigger. You can see that uh, mustache over his top lip, mustachio. I think this is me. Yep, fight made, Titan trigger. Uh, you can see the nice. different color on him. Come in assorted colors. Did you see that fly? Yeah. That's my crack the code fly. Buddy, I'm not going to put my hand by your mouth, that's for sure. So this next vid uh, I'm showing because it, it was just a cool cast, right? Uh, we had a hard wind blowing that day and was blowing over my casting shoulder, my right shoulder. And so I had to cast off my left shoulder with a double haul. And uh, I had been practicing it before I left, but uh, I finally had to put it into practice here and um, made the cast. Trigger came out and grabbed it and went into the hole in the coral. And it happened oh, quick. See that? There he is. Don't go in that hole. I think it's the trigger, huh? You see, that's the area they like. They like where coral is. And due to time constraints, um, I can't really show you what happened after this. Uh, the guy took off his shirt. He put his head under the water. He was going to dive in there. And then um, the line was shredded on the coral. So I didn't really get to see uh, him go in there and, you know, chance losing a finger. This next video, uh, it's just kind of funny because once again, um, the guy was kind of poo-pooing my, my fly. And I don't know why, because I was catching triggers in front of him and one of the clients I was with him. But um, he didn't want one, so I just kept using it. And you can see over to the left, once I start this video, how they're just watching me because I had just released one like 10 minutes prior to this cast. They're over there, they're watching me. <laughs> Fish on. I hear me snicker. I tried to tell them there's flies. And if you look down there by the reel again, you'll see fish scattering. See that? There's triggers all around me. Are, look at this. I mean, there are triggers all around me. I must have looked. I must have hooked six or seven triggers that day. And that doesn't happen often. And it hasn't happened since. So look at that. I mean, to me, they're just a beautiful fish. Look at the eyes, look at the designs on those fish. They're worthy quarry, um, but they're also highly frustrating to fish for. So trigger fish tips, um, only cast to tailing triggers. Uh, like I said, when they're tailing, you can get real close on them and make a good cast. Uh, try to land the fly slightly past the trigger and do one small strip, and that gets their attention, right? And then uh, do short strips. What you want your fly to mimic is how a crab actually moves. And, and a crab doesn't move, you know, one to two feet. They only move like a half an inch to an inch. So that's what you want to mimic. Um, you want to tie your fly directly to the leader. Don't use a, uh, a loop knot because they nip at the fly. And so a lot of times um, they won't 
totally have the fly. And if it's on a loop, you know, it's not tight to the fly and you'll lose them. Uh, don't use anything under 30 pound test because, you know, once it's hooked, you got to put the brakes on them and keep them from going into the coral in their hole or over the reef shredding your line. And uh, remember when releasing the fish, always keep your finger away from its mouth. So the next fish we're going to talk about, this is the third out of the uh, group. It's the giant trevally. Um, what can you say about giant trevally? I mean, if you've ever hooked one of these things, you'll never forget it. I mean, I have, I don't know if it should be called a nightmare or dreams because when they come up on you, they come up hard and fast and you'll panic, right? They're called the uh, thugs of the flat because they're the apex predator on the flats. When they come up on the flats, everything scatters. I mean, it looks like, you know, they dropped a, uh, you know, a bomb on the flats. Things just start blowing up out of the water because these things move at mock speed. They turn on a dime and they brutally attack fish. But they can also be really spooky. So, you know, the big GTs didn't get, you know, big by being dumb. So um, what I can tell you is if you plan on fishing GTs, um, spend a day or half a day specifically charging or, or um, going after GTs because they're not easy to catch. And, and normally when, you know, you tell your, your or you tell me, I want to fish GTs the next day, um, I try to pair you up with the best GT guide. Uh, these guys, they're all good, but some are good at more specific type fish. So um, get you with the GT guide. And what you mainly do is you go to interception points and you wait for them to come in with the tide or go out with the tide. So this vid is a, a video of me, my very first time uh, on Christmas Island. This was shot about five or six years ago. And uh, my very first time on Christmas Island, um, my very first GT, you can see that that rod, when you're fishing GTs, you know, I don't even want to say it's, you use it as a, uh, a leverage to battle the fish because really that rod does not, you know, <laughs> there's hardly any bend to it, but um, it's the reel that makes a difference. And that's a behemoth reel made by Reddington. And I had done my research before I left and I had a hatch 11, but I wanted a backup reel. So I did research and I got that behemoth uh, by Reddington and it made GT's whimper. I mean, you can tighten that drag down and hook a line to a, uh, a compact car and put it in neutral and you can actually pull the car without that drag even moving. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because you'll see how that drag actually moves when it's hooked up to a GT. It's fully locked down. See how the rod is? Said I keep the tip up or low? Up. It's up the, the corals. The line away from the corals along the slope. You can hear him running. I mean, <laughs> and now he's going. <laughs> he's now. Now into my backing. You see me keep looking at my reel because I think I'm going to get spooled. Tell him to time out. Time out. <laughs> now I know I'm going to get spooled. But due to time constraints, this is what my very first GT. And actually, he wasn't a hundred pounder. I'd say he's probably only about 50, 60. But for my first GT, I was uh, pretty happy. Um, I've caught quite a few since then, but uh, you always remember your first. You can make it uh, first. Yep. 
like that a few times and then you feel stronger. Off you go. That's Justin with GT. I mean, these things, you know, they don't give you any quarter. If your knots aren't good, if your equipment isn't good, you can forget about it. This is uh, that one girl I was telling you about. She put on a show. Look at the sides of that GT. They're just beautiful fish, strong fish. Another one. Yeah, you can put a feather in your cat if you can, uh, in your cap, if you can tame one of these. So I'll set this video up. So um, like I told you earlier in the presentation, you know, since I'm the host, I have to try to get everything set up. And I'm usually the last one trying to get all my rods together uh, because of all the other duties I have. So um, I knew we were going to go because of the way the tides were falling. We were going to go GT fishing first thing in the morning. So, um, you know, once again, uh, because I was, had so many different things I had to do, my GT rods were the last rods that uh, I set up and I was setting them up in the dark. And so the very next morning, uh, uh, this, this guide's name is Mutt Twanga, but we call him Matt. Um, he pointed out a GT to me and I made a cast and I'm stripping and the fish is following it and my reel falls out of the reel seat into the drink. Here's Justin and his guide, Matt, Man. put him on a GT. My he GT. I put me on one, but I decided to drop my reel in the water. <laughs> you know, just like that sometimes though. Now he's going to explain my error. <laughs> I still have to check with it. Yeah, I was like, really? Last time I tried to put a reel on at night. Dark. Okay, due to time later. constraints. But I'm happy for Justin. I mean, that's the cool thing about fishing there. There's so many fish. No, I'm getting out of the way, bro. Don't worry about me. Look at that. Freaking yes. Good job. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Guide always holds up the sign. You should be here. <laughs> There's that kid again. Uh, we're in the back country. He caught all kinds of fish. Smaller GT. So I'll set this video up. So earlier in the day, we're in the back country now. You can tell by the terrain. Like I said, it looks like uh, almost like a moonscape. Um, we have been fishing for GTs, actually not even fishing because we hadn't even spotted a GT. And so I decided to take my 10 weight and um, just go fish bluefin trevally because you can see them in packs back there. So I hopped off the truck, uh, I grabbed a cigar, lit the cigar up, and, you know, just start talking story with my guy, just looking for bluefin. And I walked about 50 yards and I spotted this dark shape really close to the uh, side of the bank. And I pointed it out with my rod tip. And I said to the guy, is that a GT? And he couldn't really see it. So I said, I'm going to cast to it. And so I'm going to put this pointer right here. Oops, let me try that again. Go back there and, sorry guys, try it one more time. Right there, you can see that black spot right there, right there where that pointer is. Watch it move. 
on the strip. Look at that. That was an exciting take. Whoa! Right. I still remember that one clearly. And this was a 25 minute fight, but due to time constraints, again. This was really satisfactory for me because it was on a fly I tied. You can see that fly in his mouth right there. You see the eye of it. Yeah, right there. It was a bait fish pattern. I didn't realize I had the cigar in my mouth while I was fighting that fish either. They kind of look like something out of the, you know, uh, the alien movie. Predator movie, but they're just big, vicious fish that won't give you any quarter. They'll they'll spool you uh, quickly if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, I'll set this one up. Um, this was during the last trip that I was there at Christmas Island, January 2020, and uh, it was the last day of the trip. And I hadn't hooked any GTs. I specifically fished GTs all that day just because I wanted to get another one. And um, this was the last two hours of the trip. And so the guy positioned me in a spot to intercept him because the tide was moving in. I was on the other side of this channel. And so uh, I'm standing there. And about 30 minutes later, with the tide coming in, um, I saw three GTs about 50 yards away. And, you know, um, I mean, I was ready. I was panicking, but I was still ready. And I made a cast, and this one peeled off and took it. And mind you, I'm only fishing with a 10 weight now for GTs, just because I'm of the mindset that I don't want to carry a 12 weight around all day uh, fishing for uh, cheats because you get wore out. So, all I do is use a tin weight now for them, but you gotta have a really good reel to stop them. And that rod was straight. I mean, didn't even have a bend in it, but to make a long story short, um, when I hooked this fish, I had to cross the channel on an incoming tide. So the water was just barely under my chin when I finally reached the other side. And then once I reached the other side, I had to run almost, almost a quarter of a mile and then walk another quarter fighting this fish. This was a triple digit fish. This was a true 100 plus pound fish on a 10 weight and 60 pound test. They get really big, especially on the ocean side there and in the back country. So close up I took. And this is Justin. So here's some GT tips. Um, like I said, if you want a good shot at catching them, you have to spend the time specifically tar targeting them. And what I would say to that is don't spend the whole week specifically targeting them because there's too many other species not to you know go after the other species, but spend a half a day or spend a day or two, whatever, but um, you have to put your time in. And remember, GTs are followers, right? So uh, you have to make a cast at least 20 feet in front of them in order for them to chase it. Then you make long steady strips and once they start following, you start stripping faster until it grabs the fly. And then, once they grab the fly, you have to strip set as hard as you can with your offhand, and that's the one that has the line in it, and the rod. Make sure you bury that hook, and then make sure you clear that line back on your reel without it catching on to anything, because that initial run, um, you don't want to have anything entangled in the fly line when they make that run. And like I said, I can tell you not to panic, but you will panic. Just hold on. Hope that all your knots hold up and pray that you don't get spooled. And um, we have a term for um, 
getting spooled or actually reels blowing up. We call it pitted. We say, ah, you just got pitted. I've, I've seen hatches get pitted where it, it burnt up, where it wouldn't work anymore. So um, I've never had that problem with the uh, Reddington behemoth. And so these are some of the other species of fish that uh, take a fly on Christmas Island. Um, and you can see black tip sharks, golden trevally, bluefin trevally, milkfish, barracuda, long nose emperor, red snapper, surgeon fish, ladyfish, queenfish, sweet lips, over 30 to 40 different species of reef fish. And I've caught them all. Uh, it's not bragging, it's just telling you how prolific that fishery is. Um, there's just so many fish to fish for that. Um, that's why I go back three times a year. So there's a black tip shark. Um, right before that, I had targeted a shark that was about six foot. Um, he took the fly. He started racing towards me. I ran up on the beach like a little girl because he was coming straight towards me. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. And he did come up on the beach some, but he wound up uh, shredding my 100 pound test. So uh, I told the guide, you know what? I think I'm gonna cast it smaller sharks. And so I got the shark off the bucket lips. Here's a uh, rare golden trevally, bluefin trevally, dusky trevally, surgeon fish, larger bluefin, uh, big barracuda. So remember those uh, bodies of water that I told you that hold nothing, but it's like a, a nursery for barracudas. There you go, back country. And uh, you can hook barracudas all day. Uh, I would suggest you have wire tippets though. There's a kid again uh, with a barracuda. Another bluefin trevally. And these are the reef fish that I, you know, I, I mentioned that you can catch 30, 40. Uh, they're, I mean, they come in all kinds of colors. You catch uh, groupers, bass, uh, wrasse, um, and they get quite large too. This particular day here, we probably caught, and, and I'm not kidding, we probably caught probably 60 or 70 a piece where we were just back there and we just said, hey man, you having fun? I'm having fun, let's just keep catching these things. And so um, there's just a smorgasbord of fish. That's why Christmas Island is such a great place to go to. It's easy to get to. It's relatively uh, inexpensive. And, you know, for the amount of species that you catch, I don't think you catch that many different species uh, anywhere else in the world. Maybe the Seychelles, but you're going to spend, you know, upwards of 10 to 15,000 in the Seychelles. This is a ladyfish. These things skyrocket out of the water. They jump, you know, seven, eight feet and get much larger than that. This is called the long nose emperor. And uh, if you look at the water and the bottom behind this guy, he's a guide also. Um, look at the fish also, and you can see how that fish is just camouflaged. This is on the ocean side. And, you know, when you're fishing on the ocean side, um, it's like fishing in a literally, like fishing in an aquarium because the water's crystal clear and there's just all kinds of species of fish that'll come up on the reef um, feeding on, you know, the things they feed on. But also this uh, fish, particular fish is very good eating also. Um, this is a golden trevally. Like I said, he caught so many different species of fish. So this next video just shows you um, how much fun we were having actually. We had a little contest to see, we put a time limit. I think it was like 30 minutes to see who could catch the most fish uh, in 30 minutes. There's that double haul backhand again. I kind of like that. This is in the back country again.
There were so many Double. fish that day. Uh, uh, triple. So after a while, I mean, even before 30 minutes, we got tired of catching all those fish. So we went fishing for a giant trevally after that. But. Another cleaning? Yeah. And so uh, there's another fishery there on Christmas Island that doesn't get um, much uh, notoriety, but I can tell you the blue water fishery is out of control. Um, you catch red bass, wahoo, yellowtail, sailfish, marlin, barracuda, bonita, skipjack, snappers, GTs, mahi mahi, rainbow runners, and you know, there's even more species that I, I can't even name. I mean, if you had conventional gear, I mean, there's just so many bottom fish you could catch by jigging. So um, this blue water fishery is virtually untapped and we're fishing for them primitively by using fly rods and, and um, we'll take a 100 pound test barrel swivel and put, you know, like six feet of a 100 pound test to it and uh, take a 10 foot T17 sink tip and attach that to the floating line. And the reason why we do that is because um, there's so many birds there that if it's on top of the water, they'll pick it up and you'll wind up flying a booby bird or whatever. So you want your stuff slightly underwater so the birds don't pick it up. But um, I can tell you, you hook so many fish that you get tired of doing it. As a matter of fact, one of the things we would do is when we were leaving the boat dock inside of the uh, lagoon, we would troll, you know, we would troll to the flats and we would hook so many fish that, you know, we wouldn't be getting to the flats in time and we just stopped doing it just because, um, you know, we actually wanted to fish the flats. So, um, it's just a prolific fishery. So this is Brandon. I felt a subtle grab and then it was a pause for like two seconds. I looked and I saw him rise again. Did you, you see the fish? I saw him rise and eat the fish. It looks like a, looks like a teeth. Nice. And this is one of those days where we just got tired of trolling, but Brandon wanted to troll. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So we gave him a hard time, a lot of banter. Tighten all the way down. Oh, nice, dude. Yeah. Keep going, work it, dude. Real, real, real. Real, always coming at you. Real, 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 real. Don't fall off the boat. Don't fall <laughs> off the boat. <laughs> a lot always of instruction. Coming straight at you. What a pump. Oh, oh you got slack in the line, dude. You got slack in the line. Don't spin it. Don't spin it. Don't what spin is that? It. That ain't a Jeep. That's, uh,. Yeah. Nice. Is that a bluefin? Yeah. All right. So those are the kind of fish you can catch just trolling inside of the lagoon. You're not even in blue water. And um, like I said, we were hooking so many, we just got tired of doing it. This is in the blue water. And you see how far offshore we are? I mean, we're only like, maybe a half a mile and we're in a thousand feet of water. So you never know what you're gonna hook when you're out there trolling. And that's why you always bring extra fly line because invariably you're going to get spooled at some point because you don't know what grabbed it, but you can't stop it from running. Uh, that's some kind of tuna and I got a barracuda. Uh, Wahoo, those are very good eating. Rainbow Runner, they get really big. And you see, we're just using flies. Uh, that's a red bass. That is a small GT. That's a larger GT. That's an even larger GT. So um, Blue Water Fishery is once again, um, and, and how you can do it, you can actually go out in the blue water for a half a day, then come back in and fish a, you know, flat. It just depends on how the tide, tides are falling. Um, yellowfin tuna, good eating. Other bluefin, I think that's either a skipjack tuna. 
but uh, we bring all the tunas back and the wahoo back just for the fresh sashimi. And so um, flies to take. So I'm just gonna tell you the flies that I take, uh, less than the learning curve for you, because when I first went over five, six years ago, um, I must have tied six to 700 flies and only used 60 of them. And so if I only had uh, certain flies to take, these would be the ones I take. For the bonefish, I take Christman Island specials, um, clouds or minnows, and um, a worm fly that I tie up. For triggerfish, uh, crab patterns, my uh, crack the code crab pattern that uh, you know works pretty good. For giant trevally, uh, brush flies, uh, bait fish patterns and crab patterns and poppers because sometimes I like um, fishing on the surface form because uh, seeing a giant trevally take a popper on the surface is something you have to behold. I mean, it's just it, they explode on the water. So these are uh, the Christmas Island specials. To the right, you'll see I tie the uh, wing with an orange. The guides like a tan wing. Uh, I prefer an orange wing, but I tie them in both. Um, uh, I predominantly tie them in fours and sixes because that's what you'll be using the most. But I'll also tie up some twos for deeper water. And then on the left-hand side, um, I'll tie them up in eights and tens with uh, bead chain eyes and smaller weights just because, you know, you may be fishing uh, a low neap tide. More Christmas Island specials with different eyes. Uh, at the bottom there, you'll see some gotchas tied up in crystal. Um, to the left, that's a Christmas Island special with a tan wing. To the right, that's one with an orange wing. Clouser uh, minnows, chartreuse and white. Also tie them up in pink just to show them something different. That's my crack the code uh, trigger fish fly. Won't stay on that one too long. And once again, uh, because you'll go through so many flies fishing for triggers because they'll bite through them, they'll go in the hole, they'll lose them. Um, I tie up like at least 60 or 70 of them. And uh, you see, I have some of Flexo crabs in there also, along with the uh, crack, the code, crack the code fly. I also tie up some shrimp looking patterns, you know, because there's mantis shrimp. Um, there on Christmas Island and you know the baby ones kind of look like that. I'll also tie up some different type of uh, shrimpy patterns just give them something different to look at. These are my bait fish patterns that I'll use for bluefin trevally. You know you have to strip them really fast for the bluefin. Um, also for larger trevally they like these bait fish patterns. This is a GT pattern that I designed. Um, they work. A box of GT flies, have some poppers in there. Uh, I tie these poppers up for GTs and uh, they explode on them. Also, queen fish will explode on them also. These are those double barrel poppers. And this fly here uh, is called a GT banger. I tied these up uh, for the uh, trip I was going to do uh, in March of 2020 but because they closed Christmas Island down February 18th, I never got to use them, but um, I really think they'll work. Um, they have a lot of movement to them. They're light to cast, and uh, I think the giant trevally I like them. Okay, so we're almost at the end of the presentation. So one of the things that, um, you know, I like pointing out is, um, you know, sometimes you get so caught up in fishing, you, you forget to, kind of live in the moment and savor the moment. So that's one of the things that I would suggest to you. If you ever get to go there, relax in Hawaii, but totally relax when you get uh, to Christmas Island, you know, take lots of pictures so you can relive, relive it and share it with your grandchildren and, you know, talk to the locals about the customs and, you know, uh, about, you know, their life on, on, on Christmas Island. And then, you know, just spend some time exploring the island. And so these next photos are just um, how I saw Christmas Island through my eyes and the lens and uh, just impressed with the uh, 
the beauty of the place. Life is simple there, you guys. This is the ocean side reef. Sunset. Me, I rarely take selfies, but man, I want to record that. Those are the mantis shrimp I'm telling you about. So the guides will dangle a piece of uh, fish over a hole and you see I'm holding the uh, claws of that mantis shrimp. Those things are razor sharp. They call them thumb splitters. And so they'll hover over a hole, uh, they'll stick their hands underwater and they'll wait until the mantis shrimp sticks his claw up out of the hole and they'll de delicately grab the claw and try to pull them out without losing their thumb. But we take those back uh, to the lodge and we boil them up and we eat them. There you go, just reflection from the glasses. Couple that uh, were with me in January 2020. Look at the white sand, I mean, and the blue water, just beautiful. This is one of those interception points I tell you about for um, GTs. And you can see those birds, those birds, a couple of them that day were hooked because we were throwing poppers at queen fish and they um, just dove down and picked up the poppers. Be chillaxing. Local life. Brandon just chilling. That was after a hard, hard day. And this wasn't Photoshopped at all. Rich, you'll appreciate this. I mean, this is how it came out, untouched. Just chilling, had a fire going, waiting for uh, the appetizers to show up. The Alaska contingent. Um, every now and then I'd take a swig of that, especially if I had a frustrating day with triggers although I didn't imbibe too much. Um, it's hard to see where, you know, the water ends and the sky begins. I mean, just beautiful looking flats to fish on with nobody around guys. I mean, it's rare that you won't, you'll see anybody else outside of your group. This is the ocean reef side. And it's just chilling here. Posing for the camera. And crab, GT skeleton that hangs up at the lodge. It's Paris Flats again. And you can see the terrain on the ocean side is so much different than the inside of the lagoon. This is the road to the back country. We left early in the morning. Again, look at that. How would you like to have all that area to fish to yourself and just fish after fish after fish? I mean, it's just beautiful back there. Again, this is uh, the ocean side. Uh, this is me. This is uh, when I did my do it yourself trip. And, and we can talk about that later. So I'm carrying my own rod. I got a rod holder. Uh, I have uh, an app called uh, Onyx Hunt where uh, I'm putting in all my waypoints that I find. You can get to any flat by driving. Uh, so uh, we drive to all these different flats, be there before the boats got there and just, um, you know, did it on our own. So the friends you meet, you know, and, um, you know, all the camaraderie that goes along with spending a week in paradise, I mean, it all culminates to the final day, but I'm telling you, it's usually all smiles. And uh, that's the last sunset uh, before we get ready to get on the plane the next morning. So um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I have uh, this last slide, which I'll go over, and it, it tells you the cost for uh, one week's stay on Christmas Island. 
And so um, I can tell you, uh, I said it earlier in the presentation, the costs vary from lodge to lodge, right? It can be anywhere from 2,700 all the way up to 4,100 where, you know, you have somebody actually walking with you, holding your hand, you know, handing you toilet paper. But if you don't need that, um, the cheapest rate I found, and it was at that last lodge I showed you, which was, um, which was Lagoon View Resort, um, it's 2,300 for double occupancy and then um, 2,700 for single occupancy. And that's the full package, you know, air conditioned room, meals, airport transfers, um, laundry service, daily boat and guide, you know, it's two fishermen uh, per guide. And then you have a $90 gratuity for housekeeping at the end of the week. So um, like I said, 2,300 is the cheapest I've found so far. Um, I also offer a, do it yourself option, which uh, I'll just put it out there. It's not for everybody because it's usually geared towards people that are uh, self-sufficient guys that are willing to, you know, get out and spot fish on their own. And, you know, we'll be walking four to five miles at a time. Um, basically the difference is, is that it's like a smorgasbord. We choose what we want to do. If we want to use the vehicle, uh, four days a week, we'll use the vehicle. If we want to use the boat two or three days a week, we'll rent a boat. And so um, the expenditures are split between um, all four guys. And so that lessens the cost, I mean, to 13 to 1500 a week. But uh, like I said, um, it's not for everybody. What you can do is um, actually have a guide with you uh, and a guide costs like, I think it's a hundred dollars a day and you just split it between two people. And sometimes um, I'll do that just because, you know, I have friends over there that are guides. And so I want to make sure they get some money in their hands, even though I don't need them with me, but it's always good to bring them because they always wind up giving me a tidbit of information that I didn't know about. So, um, you know, um, this do it yourself option to me is, is, you know, your best bet. But um, like I said, it's not for everybody. So guys, I know it was kind of a long presentation, but uh, I appreciate you guys uh, sitting in on it. And, um, you know, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, if I can answer them, I will. Anybody have any questions? Awesome, Dan, thank you. Um, I'll let some folks jump in if they want to. Otherwise, I have some questions for you, but I'll let other people have a crack at it first. Okay. Dan, do you have some uh, dates in mind that you're looking to go? Uh, is this iPhone, Rob? Yes, it is. Hi, Rob. Um, Hi, I'm, in a, I'm in Anchorage here. I'm part of the Alaska Fly Fishers down here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have dates in May, but to be honest, I don't think it's going to happen. Right. You know, right. Um, I keep, you know, contacting my uh, person in in um, Christmas Island, and then my travel agent in uh, Hawaii, and they keep telling me, you know, um, they keep putting it back a month. They keep putting it back a month. So um, I had plans on going in May, but I don't think it's going to happen. So I just wait until. Uh, they open it up. I want to be one of the first groups that that gets in there once they open because those fish haven't been fished on in over a year. So it's going to be out of control. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, keep checking back. Um, I'll definitely be posting something on, uh, you know, my Facebook page that uh, when it opens and uh, trying to get people interested in going. Thank you. Great. Oh, you're welcome. Rob. Any other questions? I was just going to say definitely um, look Dan's guide service up on Facebook, D Ray Personal Guide Service. Follow that and I'm sure that's how uh, you know a lot of the information will get out there. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. You know, Dan, I was going to ask uh, this is Fred in uh, Fairbanks. Uh, Hi, what's the best way to contact you? Um, you can, uh, actually you can write down my number, but, um, on my Facebook page, it's D Ray personal guide service and my website is D Ray personal guide service, but, uh, I'll give you my number. 
also. Oops. Okay. So you, can, you can send me a message via Facebook if you do Facebook. If not, uh, my number is 907 230-6348. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, I've been to Christmas Island twice, but not for many years. And I, uh, the one question I have is, uh, do you have a feeling on the average size of bonefish if it's uh, increasing or decreasing? It seems like there's a whole lot more effort now than there was, say, 15 years ago. Well, I could believe that because you know how things, you know, you start getting pressure, but here's what I'll tell you, Fred. Um, one thing that I noticed, because uh, you saw some of the bonefish that I caught. Yeah, the, some really nice fish. The big ones I found were more in the back country, which doesn't get a lot of pressure, right? Mm, and so okay. even, even with the, like the do it yourself, there's places that you can get back in there that I never knew that I just found out by doing do it yourself that the boats can't even get to, right? There's flats right. back in there that you can drive to. And so what you try to do is you try to, to pick out those um, solitary fish and sometimes they'll be doubled up, but usually the very big ones uh, travel by themselves and they're always on the edge of a drop off. And so I can't speak to how it was 15 years ago. All I can tell you is, is that, you know, with the game plan that I use, uh, I, I'm finding big bonefish. As a matter of fact, this last trip I did in January, 2020, um, <laughs> I was with uh, a guide and we were just walking and it was fun fishing because he was fishing too. And he said, Dan, here comes a small GT. And, you know, I, I'm looking and, and I spotted it and I go, I don't think that's a GT. He goes, you're right, that's a bonefish. I mean, this thing had to be every bit of 20 pounds. So they're there. They're just probably not as uh, prolific as they were 15, 20 years ago, especially in the uh, lagoon you know, area. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Hey, Dan, Rich Johnson. Hi, Rich. Hey, quick question. I know you talked about May being your next kind of kind of point to, but you don't think that's going to happen, and it is going to take a while for the world to open back up. So, are, you said you usually try to make three trips a year. Do you have certain time slots you try to do those in, or because they're so quick, close to the equator, month doesn't really make a difference? It's how do you how do you schedule those? Well, like I said earlier in the presentation, you know. Um, I don't really depend or go on the moon phases like a lot of guys do, but I do take it into account, right? And so uh, a moon phase is a factor um, because it's so close to the equator, the weather hardly ever changes unless you get a typhoon out of Fiji somewhere. Right, you know? right. That's my so point. Um, the conditions hardly ever change. So, um, you know, I, I, I really don't like going during the summertime. Uh, because it's really, really hot. So it's usually around, you know, Christmas, uh, November, February, March, you know, around that time. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just, I still work seasonally. So it's one of those things that I, I, on my bucket list here, buddy, but I got to try to figure out how far in advance I need to plan. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you need any assistance, uh, feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to help. Yeah, I'm known for being bashful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. Good presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. All right, Dan. Yeah, so if nobody else had anything, I was going to ask um, if you could explain what the stripping sleeves are and why you need those. I know you mentioned them. Right. Well, they're, uh, they're just sleeves that you put over your fingers. Um, one, it also protects, you know, your fingers from the sun because I can tell you the only thing that burnt on me were my fingers. So um, that's one of the reasons why you wear them. And also they act like the compression tights, right? Um, you'll have salt water on your hands, um, you know, the salt water evaporate and you'll have like a, uh, a salt water film on your fingers. And with that, you know, with you stripping line, 
that line invariably will cut into your skin and create, you know, cracks in the skin or, you know, cuts. And like I said earlier, that's the last thing you want to have in a tropical location. You don't want to have cuts because they get infected quickly. So um, I'll put stripper sli uh, sleeves on uh, my fingers um, just to protect them from line cuts. Got it. Thanks. Uh, and then good. what uh, currency do, do you use out there? Just US dollars? or And Australian. Okay. Yeah, but I hate trying to figure out the difference. So um, I just, you know, use US currency. Cool. And there any species you haven't caught yet out there that you really want to? Um, you know, to answer that, frankly, I don't know. <laughs> you, know <laughs> you know, because I've lost a couple of fly lines on things that I've never, you know, they say there's dog tooth tuna there, you oh. know, which get up to four or 500 pounds, you know. Um, who knows? But uh, like I said, there's so many different species of reef fish. And then the jigging. I mean, we took conventional gear over one time just for giggles. And we were catching grouper. We were catching uh, bohar bass. I mean, we caught so many different species that, you know, it was just mind boggling. So, um, I can't tell you if there's anything else <laughs> there that I haven't caught, but I can tell you we're up in the uh, almost double digits of the species that I have caught there. That's pretty exciting. You never know what's going to come out of the water next. Not when you're uh, trolling in the blue or trolling in the lagoon and when you're fishing the reef side uh, because, you know, the ocean side, because, you know, there's just, you know, anything could come up. Usually in the uh, lagoon area, in the flats, you pretty much know what you're, you're going for. Those guides know those tides like the back of their hand, so they can tell you, you know, uh, with certainty, yeah, we're going to find bonefish here. Uh, we'll fish deeper water where you can't even see the fish, and they'll tell you, you know, there's schools of bonefish in here, and, you know, golden trevally. So, um, you know, usually you're not surprised by what you catch uh, inside of the lagoon, but it's always on the outside that you never know what you're going to hook up. Gotcha. That's pretty cool. Okay, well, maybe we'll open it up one more time to any more questions and then wrap things up if that sounds good. Oh, uh, there's a question in the chat. What do you prefer for wading boots in the coral? Um, I bought some... Um, because my feet are so big, you know, I have a size 15 foot. And so I've never been able to, you know, buy a uh, flats wading boot from Sims. And so I just did some research. And uh, as a matter of fact, hold on, I'm gonna go see if I can find that boot. It's right over here. I'll hold it up. I don't know if you can see it or not. This boot, I think, is made by NRS, right? And they use these boots, come to find out. Uh, Navy SEALs used them because, um, you know, they do a lot of hiking and they walk through water and um, they have a sturdy sole. You can see this hard sole here. Yeah. And drain holes. I mean, there's mesh in here. They also have a uh, Velcro strap that's built in and the cool thing about it is they have a liner inside so you don't have to put a liner in your your boot all you need is uh you know a wading sock so um i'm trying to I, i'm pretty sure this is made by nrs but you want to have a boot that is um you know sturdy hard bottom because that coral is just nasty there. So yeah, this is it right here. Cool. I got, what did I, I'm trying to think where I got it. I think I got them off of Moose Jaw too. I don't know if you've ever heard of that company, but um, they only cost like, uh, I wanna say 40 bucks. So I got two pair <laughs> just in case. Yeah. 
as wading boots go for the cost. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely don't want your feet or your shoes falling apart when you're out there halfway through your trips. So. No, you don't want that at all. Um, so there's another question in the chat. Uh, person says, do you ever put on a mask and snorkel and, and dive down and take a look? And is there any diving to do near the island or on the island? Yeah, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, they offer there is diving. Um, but, you know, you know, like I said, I'm not too keen on having any kind of that water in my mouth. So I know it's ocean water, but still, you know, um, I, I don't do that. I do it on Hawaii, you know, but uh, I don't do it at Christmas Island. Um, you know, that's, that's a destination for diving. You know, it used to be one of the top producers for uh, aquarium fish, actually. Hmm. So you'll get a lot of people uh, diving there. Uh, it's also, um, I forgot to tell you, it's a wildlife sanctuary and a bird sanctuary. So if you're a birder, there's like, you know, 30 different species of birds there that you can uh, go look at. And um, some are, um, you know, quite large and colorful. Uh, I, I had a clip on there, but I took it off, but um, lots of birds there also. Right on. All right, well, let's see, any more questions before we uh, kind of wrap things up? If not, Dan, I really appreciate you giving this talk. Um, I've been wanting to hear more about your trips out there for a long time, and hopefully sometime in the future, I'd like to get out on one. It just looks amazing. So thanks for well, sharing your little slice of paradise with us today. Oh, yeah. You're welcome, Kevin, and I appreciate you uh, asking me to do this. Uh, you know, I can tell you, you know, once you go there, you'll never be the same. <laughs> so, and that's the truth. So hopefully uh, we can get a Alaska contingent going out there and uh, just go have some fun. Absolutely. And if not, maybe I'll see you around the Susitna or down in South Central again sometime. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I fish. As a matter of fact, I'm supposed to go fishing uh, Friday. So. Oh, right on. We'll see. Excellent. Well, good luck with it. And I'll keep in touch with you. And uh, we're going to put this presentation up. Definitely make sure you um, check out Dan's Facebook page, D-Ray Personal Guide Service, and give our Midnight Sun Flycasters page a like too, if, you, if you're interested in the content. Um, thanks, everybody. And, and uh, thanks again, Kevin, for the swag too. I appreciate yeah. it. And thanks, everybody, for uh, uh, tuning in. I appreciate it. Cool. All right. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting. Okay. All right. Have a good Thanks. Night. Awesome. All right. Thanks.